Well, it is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Mark Bailey, uh, and it was exciting to see him reconnect with some of you that uh, he knows from his time here in Arizona, um, which was hard for me to believe, it was now 36 years ago when you, when you left the desert and headed to, to Texas, to Dallas Theological Seminary uh, in, in 1985 as a professor. Uh, in 1997, he was appointed Vice President for Academic Affairs and Academic Dean. And in 1999, he was appointed to the role of provost. In March 2001, Dr. Bailey was named the seminary's fifth president in its 96-year history. After 19 years as president, he transitioned to the role of chancellor in July of 2020. Um, and as you know, he received his Bachelor of Arts from Southwestern College, now ACU, in Phoenix, and his MDiv and Master of Theology from Western Conservative Baptist Seminary in Portland, Oregon, and his Doctor of Philosophy in Bible Exposition from Dallas Theological Seminary in 1997. And in December of 2006, was awarded a Doctor of Divinity degree from Dallas Baptist University. For 40 years, his passions have been theological education and pastoral ministry. So in addition to his time at Dallas, he has served in various pastoral and preaching roles at a number of churches in Arizona and Texas. He's led tours, numerous tours to Israel and the Middle East, and he authored a number of texts. His board service includes Bible Study Fellowship, Walk Through the Bible Ministries, Word of Life, International Alliance for Christian Education, and Steve Green Ministries. Dr. Bailey and his wife, Barbie, who was also with him here at Southwestern College as students, have been married over 48 years. They have two married sons and six grandchildren. So it is my great honor to introduce to you, um, I say, our most distinguished alumni, although there's other alumni in the room, maybe I shouldn't say that, but obviously somebody who's uh, done an amazing, just had an amazing career serving the Lord, uh, and we're just grateful anytime he comes back to Arizona to be with us. So please welcome Dr. Mark Bailey. I do not claim that title of the most distinguished alumnus from uh, Southwestern. I would never claim that title. Uh, but it's great to be back and uh, to see, thank you, to see some familiar faces and uh, reconnect. And uh, my congratulations to President Munsell and his wife Tracy. They've become good friends. We see each other at uh, wild and crazy places uh, with regard to higher ed and uh, the uh, uh, Inter International Alliance for Christian Education, of, in which I serve on the board and uh, one of the founding board members of that this last couple of years. And we've had a couple of those meetings. and. Uh, that's a, uh, an organization that's been designed to minister to those from basically cradle all the way through the PhD programs and to bring some, uh, some unity to Christian education around the world from that standpoint. So uh, it's a, a fun group to be a part of, and Dave Dockery is the president of that, who's a dear friend. So uh, it's, a, it's just a privilege to be back on this campus. This is my second time on this campus. I spent a lot of time on the other campus as a student. Uh, and they were trying to get me to tell weird stories from my student days uh, this afternoon, but uh, nine of the best years of my life, formative, I would never be doing uh, what I have done for the last 35 years in the classroom and in administration at Dallas Seminary had I not had those nine years. Uh, I, I left uh, Phoenix to get out of administration and uh, to go just teach Bible, and uh, the uh, college was so gracious in sending me off with their blessing to do what I love to do, which is teach the Word, and uh, ended up in administration, and, uh, but now I'm free of that. And so I, I, I heard a, a, a story the other day, uh, or a phrase the other day that I've applied, and that is, uh, those aren't my monkeys, and that's not my circus anymore. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I miss the camaraderie of the board, I miss the camaraderie of my executive team, the faculty, I've loved all of those relationships, but I don't miss the agendas at all. And so uh, I just to get back, chancellor, my chancellor role is a five-year commitment with renewables uh, after that, uh, to teach, to write, to represent the school, and uh, just to be uh, a prayer warrior and a cheerleader for the new president, who uh, is Mark Yarbrough. He was my grader and has come up through the ranks, and it was so, so fun to watch God develop him and smooth handoff. And uh, so I'm uh, one of his biggest uh, cheerleaders and biggest prayer warriors, and we pray for uh, our Christian leaders every single night. Barbie wishes she could be here. Uh, she's back home, and uh, she had, uh, was feel not feeling really well over the weekend, so she stayed put but she sends her greetings, and those of you who know her, 
Uh, and no, we, I started dating her when she was 16, and I was 18, and so we've raised each other. Uh, but if you know her and you know me, I did the better job. Because uh, she turned out a whole lot better than I did. And so, uh, but we have two sons that are best friends. We all go to the same church. Uh, one is a choir and orchestra director at our church, and it's a multi-site church in Fort Worth, Christ Chapel, and you can go online and go, if you YouTube it, you'll see him directing choir and orchestra and, and that. And the younger son, Jeremy, he's a coach at a Christian school, uh, Temple Christian School, teaches uh, Bible and economics and history, and what else do uh, coaches teach uh, besides those courses? But uh, he, he's the head football coach and uh, t coaches track as well. But, uh, so I have an older set of uh, grandchildren and a younger set of grandchildren. Uh, and so uh, my oldest is 17. Uh, she's our only uh, baby girl. Uh, she's our only granddaughter. And so she had her first full-time job uh, this summer as a lifeguard at a splash, uh, you know, pool at, uh, near their house. And so she's driving, and that's really helpful for the rest of the family, but it's really weird for us uh, who watch that. And uh, then the rest of them are boys, and they go all the way down to, the, to our three-year-old, who's the only blonde, blue-eyed Bailey in the whole clan. So... Uh, I should have brought a picture of them, but I can show you on my iPad if you want it. Uh, for this time, uh, we're going to dive into the scriptures. They've asked me to uh, speak to you from the Word and to talk about the gospel in uh, the present age. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Uh, to You can scan them, open your phones, whatever kind of a text you have. Push, pull, you know, flip, whatever it is. And turn to the last two verses of the Old Testament. The last two verses of the Old Testament. I want to ask and answer a question tonight. And that is, what happened to the kingdom at the first advent? What, what happened to the kingdom of God and uh, the crisis of the first advent? We were talking in Dr. Munsell's office this afternoon about uh, what was life like in the first century. And we in the 21st century are starting to approach those conditions again, where uh, emperors claimed to be God, uh, homosexual, uh, homosexuality was rampant, taxation was high, tyranny was huge, uh, slavery was abundant, and uh, <clears throat> yet God chose that as the fullness of time to birth Christianity. And if, if it can be birthed and flourish in the first century, there's no reason it can't be birthed in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls in the 21st century. Uh, God's not limited to uh, our time. He wasn't limited to that time. But what, what, what happened to the kingdom? It really starts with Malachi chapter 4, uh, verses 5 and 6, if you have your Bibles. Because the last expectation coming out of the Old Testament was that uh, Elijah was going to show up. Elijah, as you know, went to heaven. But uh, Malachi says, uh, or I like to say Malachi, who was the first Italian prophet, uh, <laughs> the Malachi papers we have you know, in the text. But uh, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and uh, awesome, some translations have terrible, day of the Lord. It's going to be great and it's going to be terrible. It's going to be awesome because it brings both blessing and judgment. But it says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. It is an ominous note of uh, Elijah, as you know, showed up. Uh, he uh, went in a leather belt and uh, skins and ate like a, a hermit and smelled like a hermit, probably uh, lived like a hermit, uh, eating locusts and wild honey. And uh, he was a thunderous prophet of the Old Testament. And uh, he's the predecessor of one who comes in the New Testament, as we're going to see. But the expectation is what I like to call EMK. Elijah is going to precede Messiah, the Lord, Yahweh, who's going to come. And uh, ultimately, the day of the Lord is going to be consummated. The day of the Lord is a term that's used in the Old Testament for near-term events, where God is acting in human history for his benefit but it has far-reaching events, the day of the Lord that uh, is coming uh, at the end of uh, the age. And so uh, the, the expectation as we come out of that is Elijah will precede Messiah, who will set up his kingdom in the day of the Lord. Uh, and so I call this an EMK expectation. So I, I want to take you through a little bit of a chart. The Old Testament expectation was EMK, which is Elijah the prophet, the Messiah, and ultimately the coming kingdom. Uh, as you know, Christ will say, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the day of the Lord brings kingdom consummation. And so uh, this is the expectation from the Old Testament perspective. They had a twofold time frame, a, a time of prophecy and a time of fulfillment. Uh, the time of prophecy was called this age. The time of fulfillment was called the age to come. 
Uh, that was the expectation. Once Messiah would come and, and do his thing, so to speak, it would be the, the ultimate uh, end of the ages. Uh, this age is the age of prophetic uh, expectation. Uh, the age to come is the time of kingdom fulfillment. The problem was, he came. Okay, and the first coming, at, at the first coming of Christ, the expectation at the first advent was that uh, God would judge the nations, destroy all the wicked, and save Israel. That, that was the expectation coming out of the Old Testament. The judgment of the nations and the salvation of Israel. Uh, the problem was, what about the EMK expectation? And so we get an EMK fulfillment, ironically, and that is uh, E in quotes, uh, M without quotes, and K kingdom in quotes, as we'll talk about. Because if you ask John the Baptist, are you, the, are you Elijah? He said no. But if you ask Jesus, he would say yes, if you could handle it. And so you have New Testament passages as you read the Gospels to say that uh, he, he's the Elijah to come if you can handle it, and you did to him whatever you, know, you wanted to do to him. And especially on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the disciples saw Jesus in his glorified uh, form for the first time, uh, and they thought, basically, uh, it's kingdom time. So Peter says, let's build three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Uh, no, he said, uh, what did he say? Yeah, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He had learned a little bit, he didn't say and one for me, which was good, okay? Uh, but uh, because a previous chapter in Matthew's gospel, he got his uh, foot in his mouth when he said, Lord, you will never die for us. And uh, he was scolded, obviously, and thinking thoughts of men was satanic, as Jesus defined it, which is a real interesting commentary for us. Uh, human, humanism, apart from God's divine revelation, is always satanic at its core, James chapter 3. So the question is, uh, did Elijah come? And Jesus said, yes, he came, because why? If you believed he was the forerunner of the Messiah, then you were believing in the Messiah who was preceded by the forerunner, and so if you believed who Jesus was, then you understood John the Baptist was the Elijah, if you could handle it. Now, when you get to that passage, they're saying before the king, we thought Elijah had to come. And he said he did. And they did to him whatever they wanted, because as you know, he lost his head you know, for uh, pointing his finger at, at Herod for having stolen his brother's wife. And so, uh, but he says, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. And then you're starting going, wait, there's an Elijah the Tishbite, he went to heaven, Here's an Elijah named John the Baptist, and then Elijah's coming. How many Elijahs are there? And evidently, Elijah becomes an office of a prophetic uh, voice for God. Uh, Elijah, number one, who was uh, taken up to heaven, as you remember. But uh, John the Baptist preceded the Messiah and fulfilled the role of the forerunner. And when you read Revelation 10 and 11, there's another Elijah kind of a person coming who will have the power to cast down fire from heaven, like Elijah did before the second coming. And so we'll see that in a moment. So Elijah came if you could handle him. Messiah, without question, was here. But the question is, what happened to the kingdom? And when you read especially the drama of Matthew, you find out that uh, the kingdom was near, the kingdom was near, the kingdom was near. But it didn't show up like they expected it. Because he didn't destroy Rome. He, he didn't uh, save all of Israel at that point. And in fact, he came unto his own, as John says, and his own didn't believe him. They didn't accept him. There were some that did. And they, uh, by belief, have the right to be called children of God. But uh, the kingdom that they expected didn't eventuate. So what happened, as we're going to see, is that Jesus, because of the rejection that culminates at the cross, prior to the cross, begins to teach about a period of time that was unexpected in the Old Testament, an inter-Advent period. They didn't expect to be two comings. There was uh, everything in the making for both comings that are predicted, but there wasn't an expectation that he would come, then leave, and then come back again. And so that gets broken down, but we have an inter-advent, between the advent age of, of, of God's kingdom work. And in that inter-advent age, he reveals what are called the mysteries of the kingdom. The mysteries of the kingdom. I just did a message a week ago in chapel at Dallas, and uh, we uh, were in Colossians chapter 1 that talks about the mystery. But if you look up, there's over 20 references, about 27 references to mystery in the New Testament. And all of the mysteries of the New Testament basically happen during this window of time from the first coming to the second coming. And when you get to Revelation, the mystery's finished. And the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. So this is a, a mystery period that was unexpected, uh, not a second uh, story, 
not a, uh, oops, I, I blew it, let's do something different, not really even a parenthesis in the plan of God, always within the plan of God, uh, because God always had a, uh, a mind to reach the Gentiles through the mystery of rejecting Jews. And you see that played out both in Old Testament and New Testament times. And so what happens is the mysteries of the kingdom. Uh, these are the parables that you have, especially in Matthew 13 and elsewhere. But uh, uh, what happened is during this period of time, ironically, as a result of the cross, their uh, partial hardening has come to Israel, according to uh, uh, Romans chapter 11, and the grace of God, the mercies of God, are extended to the Gentiles. And so whereas in Matthew chapter 10, before the official rejection by Israel leadership, it was don't go anywhere except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, when you come to the end of Matthew 28, it's let's go reach the nations, let's disciple the nations. So what was the drama that happened between that uh, uh, don't go anywhere except Israel and then go to the nations? And that's really what this inter-advent period really displays. So at the second advent, let's advance it to this point, and we're going to come back and talk about the mysteries. At the second advent, ironically, as we said, uh, an Elijah will precede Messiah. No doubt about who he is, so it's not in quotes. But I have another Elijah who has the power to cast down fire from heaven, and we have a Moses-type person. Some think it is Elijah and Moses. I don't know. God didn't tell us. We just know that the two witnesses in Revelation have the same power that Moses had to cast plagues on the earth and to bring down fire from heaven like Elijah. So, and Elijah will precede Messiah before that seventh trumpet sounds. Messiah will show up, and God's kingdom will eventuate. It'll be consummated. I think both in history, which tells you where I am theologically, as well as in eternity. And so, uh, what happens in between? Uh, because at, at that time, according to the scriptures, there will be the judgment of the nations, especially at the second advent, as you have in the sheep goats judgment that precedes the coming kingdom, and you have the restoration of Israel. Because as Jesus promised, in the regeneration, uh, you 12 disciples will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And, Revel and I believe Romans chapter 11 talks about that uh, the conversion of Israel, Israel will be saved as in a day. And so God, uh, working with Israel through their rejection, blessing has come to the Gentiles, but the role of the Gentiles is to make Israel jealous so they'll come back to the Lord. And uh, God has a wonderful plan of uh, inciting and inviting grace and faith uh, to come together. So what about the middle period of this? The church is a subsection. It's a mystery within a mystery, because it doesn't start, as we believe, until the day of Pentecost. And it will... Uh, it will culminate with the rapture of the church, we believe, prior to the end of the age, because we believe the tribulation comes after that, in case you wondered where I was theologically. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can argue with me, and that's fun. We'll still go to heaven. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, why not get it right before you get there? That's my, no, I'm teasing. Okay, just teasing. So turn with me to, to Matthew chapter 13 for a few minutes. Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to do a running overview of uh, the parables of Matthew chapter 13, of which there are eight. And uh, he, he, he has not spoken in parables per se. He's had some parabolic sayings, like physician, heal yourself. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch, etc., etc. You get some little cryptic aphorisms, but you don't get a full-blown parable of similitude until you come to Matthew 13. So he tells the parable of the sower and the soils, uh, which uh, tells you, uh, you know, what does it take to really hear the word of God and to have uh, fruit take root in your life and produce fruit. And uh, when he finishes that, they say, why are you speaking to them in parables? Uh, to which he responds by giving them an answer. And he says, to you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Uh, but let me place this within Matthew. Ironically, in Matthew's gospel, you have narrative interspersed by five discourses. But look at the topics of those discourses. It's, it's, it's an outline of God's plan and perfect. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is uh, how does Jesus relate to the law? And he didn't come to you know, violate it. He didn't come to annul it. He came to fulfill it in his person that he will and has fill, so fulfilled some portions and he will ultimately fulfill the rest. But it's all keyed on him. He sends that commission out of the 12 to Israel. Don't go the way of the Gentiles. Don't go the Samaritans, Matthew 10. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then because of their negative response uh, personified by the leadership, in chapters 11 and 12, uh, then he starts the parables of the kingdom in the mystery period in the middle. Ironically, he then introduces what will happen in the church in chapter 18, especially with that uh, concept of uh, 
of confrontation and forgiveness that's uh, demanded in chapter 18. And then when you get the last, it's the what's coming just prior to the second coming. What's the tribulational environment that's going to happen, the signs of the end of the age and his coming. And so in, in essence, you have the grand sweep of God's plan right there, all in Matthew's gospel, which is a, a book that explains uh, what happened to the king and the kingdom at the first advent of Christ. And that uh, documents, uh, he came, uh, he preached the nearness of the kingdom as John did, as Jesus did, as his disciples did, but something happened to the kingdom. And so he begins to reveal himself in parables and these are the mysteries that happen between the time of rejection and the time of reception. Later in Matthew, he'll say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and killed those who are sent to you, how often I wanted to gather you as a mother hen would gather her chickens, but you would not. Therefore, listen to what he says, your house is left to you desolate. Judgment's coming. And you'll not see me. In other words, if I can paraphrase it, I'm out of here. You'll not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is their acceptance ultimately at the second coming, when the whole earth will mourn and every eye will see him. And so between the time of rejection and the time of reception, he introduces new truths about the kingdom. Because when he says, to you it has been granted to know, who's the you in the context? It's those who have understanding of what God's doing. To them it has not been granted, it's to conceal truth. I have two boys that we've raised, uh, my wife uh, mostly, I uh, just tagged along, and uh, by God's grace, they've, uh, you know, they've, they've followed God and they're t t teaching their kids to follow God and we're having a wonderful time. And, uh, uh, but there were things as they were being raised that we would talk in code. If we were gonna go to uh, Six Flags or something, uh, I would use some kind of a phrase that had flag in it and they would not know what we were talking about because I wanted Barbie to know but I didn't want them to know. And so uh, some of you have little kids and you know how to talk in code so that they don't get it. You know, or if you're gonna take them for ice cream or if you're gonna go on a trip and you wanna surprise them. Uh, and so, uh, and, and Jesus, uh, the parables are enigmatic uh, uh, wisdom literature, uh, extensions of proverb kind of language. The Hebrews call it the mashalim, the, the wise sayings, and Jesus is the ultimate sage. And so he begins to speak to them in parables and he says to you, Disciples, it's been granted to know, to them it has not been granted. So parables are designed to reveal truth, but they're also designed to code truth or conceal truth from unresponsive hearts. And so then he begins to tell them why, and he says, uh, uh, the one who has, more will be given him. In other words, what, what do they have? And I'm gonna show it to you in the context, it's understanding. And to those that don't have, don't have what? Understanding, even what they have is gonna be taken from them. And so it's a, it's a statement of judicial punishment that if you reject the light that God has given to you, you actually lose, you know, what you, uh, what you don't use, you lose to some degree. And so uh, the custodialship of the kingdom and the scriptures are going to be taken from them and given to another. And so what you have here is the, uh, uh, the, the promise that uh, if you have understanding, you're going to get more insight. And those of you who have come to Christ and know that, when you... Uh, uh, had the Spirit of God take up residence in your life, all kinds of things started making sense that never made sense before. Uh, because you, uh, you now understand what God's trying to do, you understand who He is, you understand His Spirit and the role of the Spirit, you understand the purpose of the Word of God, and God just keeps giving you more and more and more. And in fact, uh, to us, He has revealed these things by His Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2. But uh, watch this development here, and you're not going to be able to read this right here. Uh, but there is a chiastic or a, a great literary construction, and I just want to show it to you, don't, don't worry about reading it right now, because he goes on in that passage to say, therefore I speak to them in parables, and let's take the top part. He says, therefore I speak to them in parables. Is it up here? Oh, it is, okay. It's easier for me to read here than back there. Okay. I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they don't see, while hearing, they don't hear, nor do, do they understand. Okay, now the question becomes why? Why? Because in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but not understand. You'll keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. The purpose of this kind of a literary pattern is to frame, it's to echo for reinforcement, and it's to focus on that, that centerpiece. There's willful rejection on the part of the people is the reason they don't get it. 
They've closed their ears, they've closed their hearts, they've closed their eyes, and it's like a baby in its high chair when you want to feed them what you think is really good vegetables, and they pierce their lips, close their eyes, and turn their head as if to say, I'll ignore you and you'll go away. And that's Israel's mentality to what God was trying to do. But now watch coming out, out of that center section. Otherwise, in other words, had they, had they not done that, otherwise they would, they would see with their eyes, they would hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts and return, and I would heal them. But, see, that's their problem. In other words, uh, because of their willful rejection, there is judicial blindness. Had they not done that, God could have really helped them, as we find in the New Testament. But your eyes, because they see, your ears, because they hear. And truly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, which is the coming of Christ and his plan, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So this chiastic, this inverted parallelism, is the apologetic, if I could say it. It's the defense that Jesus gives in answer to the question, why are you talking in parables? It's because, uh, in essence, some people don't have the understanding that it takes to understand them, and you have the understanding that it takes to understand them. And so the parables that you have in Matthew 13 are, uh, in essence, a codified language for receptive hearts to understand, if I could put it in this way, what on earth is God doing for his kingdom's sake in the world in the present age? So here's a quick overview, very quick. Here's the eight. There's four that were given by the sea, and there were four that were given in the house. These are wonderful pairings, as you'll see. There's two parables on planting, sowing the soils and the wheat and the tares. There's two parables on growth. There's two parables on the value of what God is doing. And then there's, for those that get it, there's two parables on the responsibility for those who get it. Uh, ironically, there's great structure. The opening and closing one doesn't have the introduction, the kingdom of heaven is light, but there's still parabolic about the kingdom, as you'll see. The, two, the second one and the second to the last one, the wheat and the tares, take you to the judgment at the end of the age, as does the dragnet at the end of the age. You have a harvest of judgment and salvation that takes place at the end of the age in both of those parables. So just to see some things, the soils, the question is, why isn't Israel more receptive to the Messiah? And it answers it. There's three reasons people don't get it when the word of God is, is preached and the message of the kingdom is given. And uh, Satan interrupting it is the parable of the first soil. Uh, external opposition uh, to the gospel, uh, affliction that comes. And the third one is internal distractions, uh, the worries of the world, the temptation of riches, and every other thing. So we know the first parable is dealing with, uh, or the first soil is satanic interruption to keep people from being saved, as Luke says, lest they be saved. We know the last one is fruitful, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Even when there's good hearts, we don't grow at the same rate. God's a realist about that, but it's still good soil. And you say, well, are soils two and three saved or not? And, and the good question is, he doesn't tell us. And that's probably intended to scare us, rightly, not to be a soil two or a soil three kind of a person. So the problem is, why isn't Israel receptive to Messiah? Is that because productivity is determined by receptivity, and receptivity is a heart issue. If you have a bad heart, you won't receive the truth. If you have a good and honest heart, you'll hear with understanding and there'll be fruitfulness in your life. The second is the parable of the tares. In the parable of the tares, the first one, the, the, the seed is explained by Jesus as the word of the kingdom, it's the message of the kingdom. In the second, the tares are the, the darnel, as it's called, the counter wheat, a counterfeit wheat that uh, grows in alongside of wheat, and you can't tell the difference till the harvest time, but uh, the tares, uh, the sons of the Kingdom are the seed that the sower sows. The tares are the sons of the evil one that Satan sows. And so the question is, how do we account for the false religiosity in the world? And the answer is a bold one. Jesus believes in Satan. You might, but you might not, but he does. And he says Satan is countersown, a false religiosity in our world. And he does it in multiple forms. Things that look exactly like Christianity that aren't, all the way to paganism. And uh, the, the central truth is that Satan has sown a world with a counterfeit kingdom, which will not be fully revealed until 
the judgment. In fact, in the parable, it says, do we uproot them now? And he says, leave them alone. Let them both grow together, why? Because you can't prejudge God's crop. You, can't, you don't have the right to judge because you don't have the mind to judge and the insight to judge, that's God's job. And so it won't happen until the end of the age when he sends his angels and he'll separate the righteous from the wicked at that point. So those are the two parables on planting. Two parables on growth. Uh, these have been misunderstood over the years in uh, different ways, but uh, the question I think that's asked and answered by the parable of the mustard seed is, will this inter-advent kingdom of God su survive? Uh, it starts small, uh, just like a mustard seed, but it grows large enough to have worldwide dimensions. Where do I get that from that passage? And he says, uh, the, the garden seed of a mustard seed is the smallest of the garden variety. We know the orchid is smaller, but he's just talking garden you know, plants there. And, uh, and he says, but when it grows, it grows bigger than a, a, a garden bush. And uh, if you've ever been to Israel, there's mustard trees, not just mustard bushes, and birds of the air nest in the branches. That's not a, a bad scene, as some have thought. In fact, it goes back to Ezekiel and Daniel. And what it means is that uh, there's international representation in the trees. That's what Ezekiel predicted, that's what Daniel had as he uh, interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's situation. And so the issue is, will this kingdom survive? And it says it starts small. How small? You ready for this? John the Baptist, Jesus, 12 disciples minus one. Okay, this, this new thing that God is doing is a new thing. It was not expected, was not seen or expected by the Old Testament, that God would establish his kingdom based on a redeemed heart, not on political power. Now, he'll one day ex exercise political power, but that's not how the kingdom is developed. And so it starts small, but it's gonna grow large. How large? To international proportions. And we're seeing that even today. It continues to grow. And that's the mighty works that Jesus said will be greater than his because of an international uh, ministry that will go on for years and around the world. And in fact, uh, how successful will this be? Uh, how widespread will this be? In fact, the leavening process explains that. The leavening process asks the question, how will this new kingdom grow? It won't grow from external organization. It grows from an internal dynamic and it's leaven. Now you're saying, wait a minute, isn't leaven a symbol of evil? In some passages, yes. One particular feast, leaven is prohibited. Other Israelite feasts, leaven is prescribed. Leaven means to permeate. It can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. Context has to determine. So the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, as Luke uses the phrase, will grow until everything is leavened. You say, whoa, whoa. Question, does God's kingdom get defeated with evil? The answer is no. Will God's kingdom ultimately win? The answer is what? Yes, and that's why in Revelation, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Cha-cha-cha, okay? It's not in handles, but it's okay. So it's gonna grow from an internal dynamic, not from an external organization, but it is gonna grow international proportion, ultimately global proportion. Will everybody be saved? No. Will there be every type, tongue, and nation represented there? Say yes, absolutely. And that's the phenomenal thing about the mission of the world. So these four are the front part. Then he goes inside and they ask him to explain things. And so in the house, he asks and answers some questions regarding the hid treasure. The tr uh, kingdom of God is like a treasure. So how valuable is this newfound program of God? Well, if you were uh, looking in a field and dug up a treasure, found out how valuable it is, possession is 10 tenths of the law, so in the ancient Near East, you would hide it, buy the field, and possess the treasure. I uh, have a sore shoulder tonight because I went dove hunting yesterday with a pastor friend of mine, opening dove season in Texas, and so we were at a field that owned by a doctor who's a believer, and uh, uh, he bought this farm, 1,000-acre farm, from another member of the church, and he just thought he was getting a thousand acre farm until he drilled and, and they struck oil. So uh, the guy who sold it to him is still sorry, but he's really glad. Uh, he's got the mineral rights to it, and he's doing really well, really well. Well, uh, how valuable is it? It's valuable, and I love the phrase in the text as you read the text of Matthew 13, for the joy of possessing it. He sells everything he has to get it. How valuable is it to be a part of the kingdom of God? For the joy that you will find, it's worth everything about you. And that's why Jesus talks about uh, wholehearted discipleship. 
of it's worth giving up everything because if you save yourself, you'll lose yourself. If you lose yourself for his sake and the gospel, you'll find yourself. You'll find out what life, especially in God's kingdom, is all about when you go after it wholeheartedly. The parable of the merchant treasure, and so here's this central truth, the kingdom of God is so valuable, it's worth giving up everything necessary to be a part of it. Ironically, for the rich young ruler, he needed to give up his wealth. Next chapter, Zacchaeus didn't have to give up anything. He just had to come. But when he came, then he realized his responsibility. Two great back-to-back -back passages. One, money can be a hurdle that keeps you from coming, but money isn't necessarily the hurdle that keeps you from coming. It can be, but it isn't always. And it may be after you've come, you realize what God wants to do with your money. And Zacchaeus is the, uh, the demonstration of a repentant heart that comes out of faith. And so uh, it's worth giving up everything. Very quickly, we're almost finished. The pearl merchant. This one has been very much dis misdiagnosed. Everybody says the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. It's not. It's not the pearl of great price, with all due respect to another religion that some of you are aware of. Uh, it's the pearl merchant. Notice this, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who was searching for fine pearls, and when he found that pearl of great price, he was willing to sell everything and get it. There's only one person who recognized the value of the kingdom so much that he spent his whole life pursuing it and gave up everything to purchase it. And that person is Jesus Christ. And I take it in this passage that the kingdom is so valuable. It was so valuable that it was established through the self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. He was the one who was the only person because we don't seek God on our own. No man seeks after God. But this one spent his whole life looking for the value of the kingdom and uh, was self-sacrificial to get it. And he purchased us with his blood, as the Bible talks about. So I think uh, that's the best way to handle that. There's other people who interpret these, some of these a little differently. Yeah, I still love them. It's okay. The dragnet. How wide should the invitation of the kingdom be? Here comes two parables on responsibility, and with this I'll close. How wide should the invitation be? Well, the illustration is the dragnet, a scene net, that uh, is taken out by boats into a big arc and then pulled to the shore, and you get everything in the net. You get boots, you get old sailors, you know, you get fish, you get uh, things that have been dumped overboard, and it's not till you get them to the shore that you start sorting out, and the good and the bad get put in separate containers, and he interprets that as the judgment at the end of the age. When the uh, wicked are taken out, and that's what happens at the second advent, the wicked are taken out and the righteous go into the kingdom of the Father. That, by the way, just for you who like to study the details, at the rapture, it's the righteous who are taken out and the wicked are left behind. But at the second advent, we believe seven years later, it's the wicked who are taken out, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. The goats are taken and the sheep are those who enter into life in the kingdom. They shine as lights in the kingdom of their father. And so uh, those, that's how you would distinguish what happens at the rapture, which is in the air, and that which happens when Jesus lands back on earth, as uh, Matthew chapter 25 says. Uh, when he comes in all of his glory to sit on his glorious throne, that's when the judgment of the sheep and the goats takes place. And the wicked are taken, and that's why the scriptures are fulfilled. Nobody gets into the kingdom except if they're born again. Okay? You have to be born again to enter the kingdom because all the wicked are taken out before the righteous go into the kingdom. So that's just a little side note for those of you who want to dig a little deeper. But how wide should the invitation be given? And I think the responsibility is evangelism should be done without discrimination. Uh, whoever wills, come. If you're thirsty, come drink. Uh, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's an uh, open-ended invitation to the grace of God to come and taste and see that the Lord is good and to come and have thirsty, the thirst satisfied. So we evangelize without discrimination. Worldwide mission, worldwide invitation, come to Christ. You'll find life, a place in the kingdom, the forgiveness of sins, ultimate shalom, a home in heaven. Why wouldn't we want to invite people to come? And the thing is, if you've become a disciple of the kingdom, you're like a householder bringing out of his treasure Things old and new. Now think. Think, think with me. Think about what we, we talked about. Old Testament expectation was what? God would come, to judge the nations, and restore Israel. That was the promise. Amos 9. 
okay, that uh, the kingdom of David will be rebuilt like it used to be. Uh, God will save Israel, as Revel uh, Romans 11 talks about. Uh, there will be people from every tribe, tug, and nation, including Israel there in the end. And, uh, but what's the responsibility if you're a disciple is the old and the new. So here's the fun. What was old is what the Old Testament predicted. What was new is what is mystery, where we started. Mystery is everything from the incarnation of Jesus to the mystery of the incarnation. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifested in the flesh, the Bible says. Then you have the mystery of Christ, the mystery of grace. You have the mystery of the faith, all of those terms. Then you have the mystery of the church, the mysteries of the kingdom in general, the mysteries of the church, as Ephesians 3 calls it, the mystery called the rapture. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We don't all sleep. We'll all be changed. Some think that's the theme verse of the nursery department, but it's not. Okay? They don't all sleep, but they all need changing. Some of you will get that on the way home. Okay? But uh, the mystery of the rapture. Then there's the mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians during the tribulation. Then there's the mystery of is finished when the Lord comes, Revelation 10 11. And then the mystery Babylon of that final anti-humanistic religio opposition to God that will ultimately be quelled and quenched in Revelation 19 when the Lord returns. All of those mysteries happen during this inter-advent age. So what is my responsibility as a disciple of the kingdom? It's teach the Old and New Testament. Teach the Bible. What did God promise? He'll fulfill it. What's he doing in the meantime? It was, it was not expected in the Old Testament, but it, boy, is it a phenomenal, magnificent plan of God to reach the world. And that's why the mystery of the hardening of Israel is a mystery. And that's what Revel and Romans 11 says. This is the mystery that God, because of their rejection, has hardened in part Israel so that the blessing, the riches of God's grace and the blessing could go to the Gentiles. And then don't get cocky, Gentiles, he says, because God can draft them back in, which is exactly what he says they will do. So what's our role? It's to make them jealous. <laughs> our role as Gentile believers is to make Israel jealous of a relationship with Christ that gives us a definition of life and beauty and meaning like nothing else. And God's promises that he made, we believe, will ultimately be fulfilled. And it's a marvelous old and new truths of the kingdom of God. So our responsibility, evangelism and edification, reaching and teaching, sounds a little bit like the Great Commission, doesn't it? Yeah. It ought to. So that's what on earth is God doing, for heaven's sake, in a nutshell. Uh, he's planting something unexpected. Start it small. Is it going to survive? Just one or two people. Not very, you know, rejection. So <laughs> it just has kept growing, hasn't it? It's kept growing, it's kept growing. And you're a part of that growth. And we're a part of that growth. And God hasn't lost the battle. God has a plan for us in a dark culture. It's always been to be light and salt. Why? Because he knew how dark it would be and how unsavory it would be. And yet he's called us to have lives that distinguish us from the world. Uh, I love what Peter says. Sanctify Christ in your hearts. Always being ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. But don't do it with anger. Don't do it with distrust, distrust, disgust. Don't do it with, he says, do it with gentleness and reverence. Because then they're going to watch your life. And the slander that they have slandered you with is going to be silenced. Because your character will back up your message. And that's going to be a winsome witness that he wants us to have. We're talking this afternoon, and we might get into it in a brief interchange, but... Uh, the world, people are not our enemy. The enemy is Satan. And the lies that he and his emissaries pull off in the world. The world is actually our goal. They're the not yet believers that we ought to be thinking about. How do we get the gospel to them? Some of us in our patriotism, if we're not careful, cheer for the destruction of the enemy when they're people. And there is a righteous judgment of the sword, no question. There is just war, no question. But do we care about their souls? Do we wish somebody had tell them, told them about Christ so they didn't have to believe a lie? And I've uh, moved in my emotions, and maybe it's partly age, 
because I don't have all that much time left. But I've, I've moved a little bit away from disgust and anger to uh, grief. They just don't know. To you, it has been granted to know. If you have a good, understanding heart, to them, it has not been granted. If there's a rejecting heart, they're not going to get it. How do we uh, reopen that door? And how does the Spirit of God turn on the lights? Becomes our challenge and our prayer. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Dr. Bailey. Um, I, when you were talking about um, <laughs> giving up everything and selling everything for the treasure, I wanted to stop and take an offering for Arizona Christian University, but, but then you moved on. Um, but wow, what, a, uh, what an incredible and timely message, and especially love the, the way you ended it um, and talking about our, you know, kind of our role and responsibility right now. You know, one of the things uh, that's happening here at, at ACU is we have now the Cultural Research Center. We have George Barna involved in, in doing, um, you know, really sort of tracking what we're seeing, in, at least in our country. And I know we, we were talking earlier today about what's happening in the world and the places where the, the church is growing and, and flourishing. But we, here in our country, we've seen uh, over the last 25 years a decline in our nation in uh, people who embrace a biblical worldview. Um, cut in half, essentially, from 12% to 6% of Americans. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the uh, uh, survey research that came out this week says that 69% of Americans consider themselves to be Christian. And so I'm just wondering, as, as somebody who's dedicated your life to teaching the Word of God and to teaching Scripture, you know, when you hear statistics like that, what do you think, you know, needs to be done as a, as a teacher of the word? Good. Uh, we've lost the ability to define what Christian means. And so uh, the, the gospel has gotten lost in the titles. And I, I worked in medicine for seven years as I was working my way through school, x-ray technology, and on the forums you come in, are, are you Buddhist, Muslim, or Christian? or Jewish, you know, so you had big broad categories. Well, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Jewish, I must be Christian. And so Christian is, with a small c has become a, a cultural terminology. And, uh, and I think in, in many ways it's parallel to uh, the term, the naked term disciple in the scriptures where some of them were following him until they really understood what he was saying and then they didn't want to follow him anymore in John, in, in John chapter six. And, your first John 5, or, or first John, it says, some, they went out from us because they were not of us. So there's always been the potential of having tares in the field. The, 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 the field is not the church, it, the field is the world in that passage. And you've got sons of the kingdom and sons of the evil one who look, uh, and by the way, tares and darnell, I mean, tares are darnell that looks identical to wheat until you break open the heart. And the only way you can tell is what's inside. They look almost identical. If you look it up, Darnell wheat and, and real wheat, the, the fake and the true look so much alike. And Jesus said that's, go, that's what it's going to be. And it's a satanic interruption. It's a satanic uh, imitation, I should say. Angels of light, Paul talks about. So uh, the difference between those two has to be uh, clarified by what is it that you really believe? Does it make a difference in your life? What's happening? Yeah. Well, and, and that's really what... Uh, is being tracked in this research is not just what you say you believe, it's actually how are you living your life. And because only God ultimately knows the heart as to, as to who genuinely um, is a believer. But I guess, we, you know, we look at um, many of the foundations that we have in this country that are based on biblical truth, and it was, that was at the center. Um, and yet, you know, there's such a clear deviation from that to where now things that were unthinkable a generation ago are now celebrated in our culture. And I guess, you know, we have the church and we have the teaching of God's word. You know, what are your thoughts when, when you hear those kinds of statistics in, in this country? And again, you can talk about all the different things that are happening other places of the world, but um, what, what do we need to do differently? Or, or is it just yeah. the sovereign work of God, the preaching is happening and yeah. more people are not uh, I'm not. It? I'm not sure that good preaching of the word is happening. You know, I think we preach a lot of morals at times without biblical truth. 
and so we're not taking people. Ironically, we still swear over a Bible. The president being inaugurated still swears over a Bible and then makes policies that are directly contradictory to the Bible. So the Bible became a symbol as opposed to the earlier days where the Bible became the principle. And that's what I think we've lost. We've had a, a, we've had a nation that was never totally Christian, never was, but we had Christian principles that were guiding principles. And, and as Adam said, if, uh, if, if we ever get away from God, our constitution really won't work because it was assumed, John Adams said, it, it was assumed that there's a biblical foundation. So I think, uh, as some have talked about, what's really happened in our culture is that we've lost an external standard of righteousness and we have become our own standard of righteousness. So authority has moved from what is objective, God-given, to now my own truth is my own truth. And so I become the measure of all things, and my feelings become the measure of all things, and who likes me becomes the measure of all things, and who friends me, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's a fact, not a feeling, and we've shifted. We've shifted from an objective to a subjective basis for making major decisions. I, I think that's interesting because when, when things become popular in our, our culture, it's very easy to sometimes go along with them without really thinking about what you're saying. And I hear so often this idea of, well, this is my truth. And, you know, the, the biblical worldview part of me is screaming, there is no such thing as, you know, yep. There, yep. there is God's truth. That's what's true. And you can have an opinion, but it's not, you know... So it's like pieces like that, how do, how, do we, how do we speak into that in a way, as you talked about, that's, yeah. that's winsome, that draws people as opposed to feeling you know, condemning and judgmental? Yeah, and I, th I, think, uh, I, I think there's some, some creative apologetics that needs to happen where you, at, where you challenge those false presuppositions. So if... Uh, if my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth, then my truth can be that you're wrong. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, and so you right. and, and so you start thinking about now that that doesn't work, <laughs> you know. Well, if it's my truth and it's true for me, then you are wrong because that is true for me, you know. And so yeah. if they say, well, no, I, in other words, your position is wrong because I think it's wrong, they're not going to allow me to have that, but they want to have that, and so that's the intolerant, you know, issue. And right. and and the issue of tolerance has become an idol because tolerance says nothing needs to change, where love says it must change. Transformation is the goal of love, you know, whereas tolerance is no change. And so to assume that there's no need for change means sin is okay, righteousness is not okay. And so the whole philosophy of, uh, of what redemption can be is lost. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, especially in these really difficult, challenging issues in the culture, it's, you know, we love you enough to tell you the truth, you know, and because there is an objective truth. And, you know, the example I use, you, you may not believe in gravity, but if you step outside from a six-story six story building, you know, you're going to feel the effects of gravity. And so with so many things that we've taught young people now that are lies, yep. we love them enough to tell them the truth and yet it's viewed as, you know, hatred or intolerance. Um, one of the things that's interesting that's coming out in the research is, you know, because what you and I are talking about is logic. And one of the things that comes out that's fascinating is that so many people hold positions that are contradictory. Exactly. So, so they, they li they're comfortable with holding positions that, are, uh, that don't make sense when you put them together. So how do you, how do you, you know, as a life of academics, how do you break through that with, yeah. a, with a student? And, I, th and I, think, I think, again, you challenge, there's a, there's a point at which you speak the truth and challenge the error, but do it in love, you know, in love. Because the, the real question is, do we really believe God has a better way to live than the world does? And I uh, was talking with Dennis Rainey, who founded Family Life and Family Life Radio. He's on our board at the seminary. And, he was doing an Easter devotional this year. He called me up and wanted my input on it. And so we were talking, and, he, and we got to talking, and everything that we're facing in our culture started with a question. Did God really say that? That question, did God really speak into that? And if the answer to that is no, then it all, all the dominoes go down. Uh, and the same thing on the inerrancy of Scripture. If one part is wrong, the whole thing's gone. 
because the Bible says all of his words are true. You know, and, and, the, and the word of God is living and active and alive, and it'll live forever. And uh, all scripture, passe graphe in Greek, every passage of scripture is God-breathed and profitable. So if there's any of it that's not, then the self-testimony of the scriptures is gone, and if that's gone, everything's gone. But uh, coming back to the, the, Ill, the illogic, Ill, that which doesn't make sense logically, we have very, in our tolerant culture, quote unquote, we have pluralism on the one end, and atheism on the other, that both are respectable within the culture. But those are mutually contradictory. You can't have many gods and no god. One of them is wrong, if not both. And so there's your logic that's not logical, is that, you know, if I can say, Oprah is very fine with pluralism and atheism. And those can't be both right. Either there's a lot of gods, <laughs> or there's no god, but you can't have both of those being true at the same time. And, uh, and that's where Paul on, the, on Mars Hill in Acts 17, one of my favorite passages, he, he confronts both the philosophers in a way that, uh, because uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics both contradicted themselves. Uh, both thought God, one thought God was in everything, the other one thought God was way far away. God was interested in us, no, he's not interested in us. And, and Paul drives a wedge right between them all with the truth. And so uh, it reminds me back in uh, the Gospels where the Herodians and the Pharisees couldn't have more distinct political views, worldviews. They get together to get rid of Jesus because he's invaded their territory. And, uh, and to use another imagery, the strong man has come and uh, he has the power to bind the stronger. The stronger one comes to bind the strong man and they don't like any uh, of the thoughts that they're gonna lose control. Yeah. Strange bedfellows get together against Jesus. Let's talk a little bit about higher education in, in seminaries. And I, I mentioned the foundations that we have. And, and, you know, this week in the news, you look back at the history of our country and, and you go back to the Ivy League schools and, you know, 105 of the, 103 of the first 105 institutions were, were created to glorify God, to prepare often pastors for ministry, as Harvard was. Yep. Um, that was its purpose. And this week, Harvard hired as their main chaplain an atheist. Chaplain of the chaplains. Chaplain of the chaplains is an, an atheist, atheist. Like, why are you at there? Harvard. Why are you there? <laughs> so, I, I, so I guess the, the, the question is, you know, having, having spent your career in, in Christian higher education, and yet we see often uh, Christians going into Ivy League institutions, the, the, the prestige, the, the credibility, even public universities that are prestigious, um, you know, I, I, I guess my question is, are there things that, I mean, emphasis on that, you're redeeming, there's ministries that are at work there. Um, you know, many of us uh, came to faith or renewed our commitment to the Lord in a, you know, public university or a state university, a very secular setting, but people of God were there working um, versus you know, pouring support into the Christian universities and seminaries. Um, how, how, do you, how do you look at that? I think we need to do both. You know, I think one is a discipling ministry uh, in Christian education, and the other are uh, forays of evangelism and hopefully discipleship that happens on, and there's a number of great groups on, on college campuses that are doing some terrific work. Our number one feeder school in Dallas is, is Texas A&M because... Uh, they have a, a ministry there called Breakout, sorry, Breakaway, right? There's my DTS guys, there we go, okay. Dr. Bob Beer's up there. They have Breakaway, our, our grads have been leading that for the last number of years, and they, they get uh, thousands of students in Reed Arena down there uh, singing and praising God and having a Bible study. And it's a, it's a dynamic ministry on the campus of A&M. And so I, I love that, uh, but I think, I think the choice for a parent and the choice for a, a college student is Am I mature enough to handle the opposition? And uh, am I strong enough to be an evangelist and a missionary, or am I gonna get swept away by it? And I think Paul talks about the danger of being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And so the slightest challenge to your faith, I mean, I, I had a professor, I went to uh, Southwestern, and then when I went to Western, I was deficient because I was science, you know, majored in x-ray technology for a couple years before I came to Southwestern, which is now ACU, 
And uh, so when I went to Western, I was deficient and I needed to make up 12 hours in liberal arts. And one of those was an English lit class in which the professor took the last 10 to 15 minutes of every class to bash the Bible. And just say oh, Genesis 1 to 11 is poetic myth. We know it's poetry, therefore it's mythological and you can't trust Genesis. And so he, I mean, he was just tearing it and the students are sitting there just lap, 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 you know, and reinforcing their reason why they don't want to go to church, you know, at that point. And uh, so a guy by the name of John Kohlenberger, who's now with the Lord, who actually did the uh, NIV concordance, uh, was a, a linguistic scholar, uh, taught at Multnomah for a number of years. John and I were taking the course together, and he was at Multnomah, I was at Western, and uh, so we became friends, and we finally headed up to here with that. So we finally went up to the professor after one of the classes and said, sir, w without being disrespectful, we, we need to tell you that uh, John is the Hebrew guy, you know, and I was the Bible X guy, but I said, we both study Genesis, and Genesis 1 to 11 is not written in poetry, and it's not written in mythological style, number two. And it's, his, it, it's historical, you know, uh, narrative, and there's some poetical statements in it, but it's, it's historical narrative, and the rest of the Bible treats it as that. And he just didn't know what to say. And we said, sir, we'd appreciate that you would at least not tell a lie to the students. And uh, John asked, do you speak Hebrew? And the guy says, of course not. And he says, well, I do, and it's not poetry. <laughs> There's not the accentual, you know, uh, rhythm of the, of the text and stereometric, you know, design. And, uh, but so we, we confronted him, and he quit doing it while we were there. And so, but the, the question is, if we hadn't done that, here's a whole semester of Bible bashing. And we've been doing a project for the Leadership Center at Dallas Seminary, and uh, we're just waiting for some funding for it as well, where we're interviewing campus leaders who are believers on campuses, three per state. We want to get a, a research base of 150 universities and asking them what's the biggest obstacle to being a Christian on your, on your campus. And, I, and ironically, Bible-busting classes, you know, faith-busting classes is one, but sexuality, and that's the big challenge even for believers, of the temptations of sexuality and having sex week and things like that, you know, that are celebrated on these campuses, that's a bigger issue to, than, than most of the philosophical kinds of questions. So a lot of it is just, uh, is a person steeped enough in their Christian life to not be a friend of the world, which means to be an enemy of God? And, uh, and if you have that ability, and if the major, and I would say if you can't get the major at a Christian university, uh, take a year of Bible prep before you go to the university, get, do a gap year or something to get ready for it. But, uh, so I, th I think there's a place for both, but uh, recent statistics you and I were talking about with a, a recent report I saw this week, the difference on Christian marriages, a statistical difference, huge difference of measuring marriages where the marriage partners went to a Christian school or a Christian college and where they are today is staggering in the last 25, 30 years. It's a huge, and I, I forget the study, I need to, I've got it. Uh, so much more likely to stay married in a, from a, if, if, they came, a if they went education. to a Christian yep. college, okay. Yeah. And, I mean, and, then, and it's so staggering, yeah. so staggering, yeah. Well, one of the things that we so were- So God loves you, but your kids <laughs> need to come here. <laughs> Willow, well, and, Willow, I, no. and I agree with you uh, <laughs> on, on what you were saying, uh, especially that, but, um, but I, I would also say, you know, one of the things I say to parents and, and to students is, you know, if you really want your life to count for the kingdom, you need to be prepared. Yep. Come to a place that's going to surround you with the word of God, that's going to surround you with mentors, faculty members that love Jesus and that are going to help you grow in your faith. Because... Um, the college years are just so pivotal. They're, they're so critical in the lives of young people. And, and so, um, you know, you, you don't always know. And that's where, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for, you know, the Christians that were, in, that were at Arizona State University when I was there. Um, but at the same time, I see the difference uh, of, of our students when they come through here. Because the, the culture's still there. All the threats, all the pressures are still there. Yep. yep. But here they've got a place where they know that they're going to be led back to the truth um, and, and supported in standing firm for the truth. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about are, are uh, at some of the meetings that you and I have been at with the International Alliance for Christian Education are the threats to our religious liberties, even as institutions 
that believe that the Bible is true, um, you know, again, we were the center of the culture. Now we're considered, you know, it, it went from being the center of the culture to uh, Christian beliefs were being seen as somewhat quirky, but, you know, not that big a deal, to now they're considered evil. Yes. Uh, and and there's a, there are forces in this world that actually want to shut down institutions like ours that hold to what's true uh, in, in Scripture, regardless of what the culture is saying at a moment. So what is, what is Dallas doing on, on that front, and what do you think we can do um, to engage, yeah. uh, uh, to defend our rights? Let me talk about the institutional level, number one. Uh, the most critical thing that a school does is hire a president, add a board member, or hire a faculty member. Those are the three pivotal things that can start a, a departure. So the diligence and the vigilance that it takes to say, are you with us? Do you hold this? No, just sign it so you can have a job, but do you, do you eh, pardon my weird analogy, have you swallowed the Kool-Aid? <laughs> Righteously speaking. You know, are the truth Kool-Aid. Yes, yes. yeah. are, you, are you here? And, uh, and don't wink when you sign, you know, that type of thing. So I think from an institutional standpoint that what, what can get lost, and by God's grace, Dallas is going into, we're, we're about 98 years in our history, uh, so we've lasted longer than most schools last. But uh, what we're seeing is a, an overthrow of basic biblical statements by s Christian schools because they've allowed the cultural interpretations to, uh, in essence, redefine it. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, we were talking today, I, 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 I think a, a simple acid, you know, litmus test is to say, since the Bible says don't forsake the public reading of the scripture, can I stand up and read any portion of the scripture and say this is God's will, this is God's word, and sit down? If I've got to say no, 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 that's not what it means, uh, then what we are saying is that it's, it takes a, a pope or a priest to reinterpret the scriptures for the layperson, where the Reformation was born out of getting the Bible back in the hands of the people. And what did the Bible say? You know, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. You know, the whole sense is literalis. And, uh, and to get people into the scriptures and read it for themselves is the biggest you know, protection factor. But I think at the, that's at an institutional level. So that's, so that's internal threats that's internal. to our yeah, mission. Yeah, the loss of biblical conviction and authority. Okay. Yeah. And what about external? I think the external threats is uh, the cultural winds, obviously, are redefining uh, personal, personal. You know, you can be who you want to be regardless of what God has made you. Uh, you, uh, you know, uh, sexuality can be your own, you know, whatever you want it to be, and you can practice sex any way you want to practice sex. Uh, so the whole, I think sexuality has become the number one cultural issue of attacking biblical authority in, in our day. I think uh, personhood is the other one, okay? And the loss of Imago Dei, the image of God in humanity, and, uh, under, not, and missing the creator and the creation factor of that. But I think that uh, the external threats are uh, we could lose uh, the possibility of government grants, uh, any kind of public funding. Uh, some schools choose not to take any of that just out of self-protection, but I think our tax-exempt status is a potential issue. I think accreditation is a potential, that if you hold that, we can't accredit you. That's already been attacked in, uh, in the law schools in Canada you know, and so forth, so that you can't pass the bar in Canada if you hold to a biblical view of sexuality, et cetera. So I think it's coming, and, uh, and I think the question will be for, and I think the rig challenge, and it's, it's, it's wild and woolly to talk about, but can we continue to, po to po po position graduate school, undergraduate school in the American educational system, or is it going to have to be a different system? You know, and, uh, and will we be ostracized to a point of uh, we'll have to be our own, you know, from that standpoint. And that's huge. Yeah. That, that'll take, uh, that'll uh, test the metal, it'll d diminish some numbers, and it's gonna, it's gonna find out who's who. You know. that's, that's the worst case scenario. You and I both have a heart that God'll bring it around a lot better than that. Yeah, I, the way I've been describing it lately is that, you know, we've got two things on a collision course. And that is, you know, we've got this sort of authoritarian, cancel culture, you know, uh, orthodoxy that's being imposed by the culture right now. 
But I think up against that, you have the Spirit of God and the potential for an awakening yep. to occur. Yep. And I think we're seeing signs of it uh, among young people already. And at some point, they're going to collide. Yep. And, and the question I have for institutions like ours is, you know, will, will they collide at such a point where we still exist mm -hmm. or after we've been removed to the periphery of, of, of culture? Yep. Uh, but we know who wins in the end, and, yep. and, that's, yep. and that's the good news. Yep. Um, well, we are about at the end of our time, uh, but I, I will ask, I, I know, can you stick around if there are a few people that want to chat or anything afterwards? I didn't. Sure. I didn't. Okay. Uh, but I, I didn't want to. I don't want to cut anybody off. But is there anyone my, with a burning? It's my, it's my bedtime in uh, Dallas, but don't worry about it. No. It's like, <laughs> anyone with a burning question that you that you want to ask Dr. Bailey before we before we wrap up? What are you going to do next? Me? <laughs> what are you going to do next? I serve as uh, chancellor, which is a uh, it's a five year com initial five year commitment. I've never had a contract as president. We just run the school well. Do you have a contract? I do. You, that's good. I didn't have one. I would just <laughs> run the school well. If you don't, we're, you're out of here. But uh, I had one as a faculty member. So, Actually, uh, that guy gave it to me. So, <laughs> so uh, but I do, and, and they, they wanted to formalize. That was their choice to formalize the relationship and so that I knew what, was, that I could, what I could expect and so forth. They're being very gracious. I still serve as senior professor of Bible exposition, so I, till, I still teach a couple classes a semester either online or live or a hybrid and so forth. And so uh, I'm teaching, doing some writing, representing the seminary in that capacity. So I'm semi-retired. Uh, as I said, I, I don't have the, uh, the bells and whistles that I have to keep going in the administration. So that part's been very, very freeing. I, my mornings are spent, I have a five-track study program in the morning. I read my Bible, Barbie and I do devotions and pray at night together, but I read my Bible in the morning, I read theology. Uh, I've never read through Calvin's Institutes, you know, uh, and so I'm reading through Calvin's Institutes now, just for fun, and uh, and that's taken a while. But uh, and I'm going, you know, and I'm going slow to to, to really digest what he's saying. Uh, ministry, leadership, and then hobby reading. And so th that's what my morning is. Afternoons, uh, we run some errands with Barbie. Uh, we have a pool, so I'm doing laps in the pool. So I'm swimming, and uh, and then she joins me, and we just talk. But uh, evenings are usually taken up uh, with six grandkids or two sons and their wives. Well, I, I think I can speak for everyone here when I say thank you for being a faithful and wise steward. Thank you for uh, shepherding the gift that you have in, in your faith and, and, and sharing it with so many uh, and teaching so many, first here in Arizona and, uh, and in Dallas for, for 36 years. We're it's grateful. A, it's a privilege, and as the parable in Luke 17 if you could assume you've done everything you were supposed to do, which none of us can assume, we're still to say we're unworthy servants. Yeah, we just get to do what we get to do. Yeah. It's a privilege. Thank you. Amen. And would you please join me in thanking Dr. Bailey? And then <laughs> well, thank you very much for being here. And uh, let me just close this in a word of prayer. Well, Father God, we are grateful for uh, the wisdom that we have heard tonight, the teaching from your word. Uh, God, we're grateful for your goodness to us in revealing yourself to us through Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful, uh, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Lord, you've given us so much and help us to be faithful in whatever time there is, Lord, to truly be salt and light in this world. And uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship we have together. And I uh, pray that you'd bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much.